I'd like to continue our study through Romans 2, and we'll ask the Spirit to uh, guide and direct our study. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible that we hold in our hands. This is a modern convenience, something that saints of old for many centuries did not have the gift of. So help us not to abuse the gift, but drive us into the text regularly on a daily basis. That as we gather here on the Lord's Day, as we corporately worship and study the Scriptures, that that would be indicative of what takes place the week before and the week after, where we're worshiping you on a daily basis as we open our Bibles and we hear from you and we breathe a few breaths of prayer in humble dependence, asking you to intervene for the praise of your great name. God, we ask that you would rivet our attention on the text and what it looks like in lives of obedient practice. For the praise of our King Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Well, beloved, I'd like to preach to a sermon that I've entitled, God's Impartial Standard of Judgment. His Impartial Standard of Judgment. It's an equitable judgment. We started off in the chapter by mentioning that uh, one of the fatal flaws that the Jewish people had was that they viewed their relationship to Yahweh as His chosen people, right? The apple of God's eye. And they abused the privilege. And when it comes to the Torah, they kind of looked at that as a talisman, a lucky charm, a lucky rabbit's foot. It's kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card. previous text of verses 5 to 11 was a message, God, the impartial judge. And we want to still look at the impartiality of God because nobody is immune from God's judgment, be they pagan Gentiles or religious Jews. Paul's going to continue on God's impartiality here. Recall that this whole section from chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to chapter 3, verse 20, is one big section that we've labeled the trial of all mankind. And in this part, here in chapter 2, it's viewed ethnically, Jews and Gentiles. And it's reported by the Apostle Paul that the Holy Spirit appointed as the court stenographer in this trial of mankind. This whole large section falls naturally into six paragraphs, six pericopes, six six thought sections. That's what a message is. We try to wrap our minds around a thought section. There's six paragraphs here. The first is verses 1 to 11, where he declares at least the Jews and possibly even upstanding moral Gentiles who are without excuse. You condemn others of the same sins you are guilty of practicing. That is hypocrisy. God's not partial or showing of favoritism. You know, favoritism is so innate to our human experience, is it not? There's an old poem that says, first impressions are misleading, for we do not know the heart. We can often be mistaken since we only know in part. Fortunately, God reveals the truth about the matter in Scripture that He shows personal favoritism to no man, Galatians 2.6. So what is innate to man is foreign to God. God doesn't show partiality. His judgment is equitable just because the Jewish people, He created the nation and they are the apple of His eye and they got the law of God. Doesn't mean they escape judgment. Well, the second paragraph we draw our attention to today, verses 12 to 16. The second paragraph contains the first direct and explicit reference to the law making the point that the knowledge of the law or hearing it provides no defense against the judgment of God. Just because you know something doesn't mean you can hide behind it. You know, in the same way that some people will have a lucky 
rabbit's foot in their pocket or their, uh, their favorite jersey that they've won that they have to win or, uh, or they wear for a game or they're not going to win the game or any other talisman. If it be true that there's no respect of persons with God when He sent His only begotten Son to pay the ransom for sinners, it surely must follow that there will be no respect of persons with God when men appear before His judgment throne. If you yourself have accepted His terms and settled out of court on the basis of the death of the Savior, then His love and His justice are alike satisfied and there is no further question, nothing to worry about. Salvation is a sure and certain matter because of the dignity of the law that's been upheld. Jesus paid it full. He was born under the law that He might perfectly obey that law that you and I have broken and His obedience credited to our account. Judge has nothing to hold against those who have been justified. But it must surely be seen that if an individual has denied the grace of God and has flouted the, the love that has been so freely shown, there can be no respect of persons when the time for judgment comes. It doesn't matter with wh whether one be a, a Jew who knew the written specific revelation, the law of God, or the Gentile who says, we never heard because here he's going to show us that it's written on their heart. They've got an innate sense of right and wrong. No place for man to hide, no excuse that can be valid, no argument that can constitute a real reason. Now stop and think about this, friend. Is there any reason that you could give to the Lord God Almighty for not admitting in this instant that you are less perfect than He is, and therefore necessarily under the condemnation of His perfect justice? Is there any reason that you can give for refusing to accept the Lord Jesus Christ who came presenting the credentials of life and who was raised from the dead as the final proof that judgment will come on the basis of His righteous provision? Beloved, I want you to be moved by the text this morning to adore our impartial God and embrace the gospel that you might escape sure judgment. Notice what the apostle says as he continues his argument, verse 11, there is no partiality with God, for all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified." For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. There's a lot of things in the secret place of our hearts, our inner man, our inner lives that nobody but us and God know about. You know a lot of people in their evangelism use the law of God. God has inscripturated His revelation in Scripture, right? He's blessed His Word, and they take people to say the Ten Commandments, which one of the commandments have you busted, because if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of the whole enchilada, right? That's good and appropriate. Paul doesn't do that here. He says every pagan that has never heard of Jesus, never cracked a Bible, has a law that God has given them in their hearts. And the conscience is activated based on that which they already know is right or wrong when, when we do right, it excuses us, and we do wrong, ack, 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 it squeals at us, right? It accuses us. So notice the first of five points here. Point one, the statement of God's impartial standard in verse 11. The statement of God's impartial standard. 
You know, our present passage will clarify and augment what Paul's already been saying about God's impartiality. Partiality, in verse 11, means literally to receive a face. That is, to give consideration to a person because of who he is. When James talks about partiality in his epistle, he says that uh, because a lot of times partiality is how people look, and you, you see this rich person come in, and you say, come sit up here, and this poor person, he said, what have you done? You've shown partiality, favoritism, which is part of our sinful human experience. Well, that exact idea of receiving a face, partiality, is seen in the popular symbolic statue of justice as a woman that is what? Blindfolded. You've seen that icon. It signifies that she's unable to see who is before her to be judged and therefore is not tempted to be partial either for or against the accused because Madam Justice is blind, whoever you are. Judgment is not coming based on what you look like. Sometimes, Lady Justice is also pictured with her hands tied, suggesting that she cannot receive a bribe. Now, that'd be a good thing in our land, wouldn't it? No bribery for politicians. Unfortunately, there is partiality even in the best of human courts, but there'll be none in God's day of judgment because of His perfect knowledge of every detail, because of His perfect righteousness, it is not possible for His justice to be anything but perfectly impartial. Such things as position, education, influence, popularity, or physical appearance will have absolutely no bearing on God's decision concerning a person's eternal destiny. God is impartial and he judges impartially. All will be judged according to their works. He's already explained that. It's drawn from his impartiality. God's impartial. Thus sinners will be judged according to the standard that they possess. So point two. The standard is the same whether you're Jew or Gentile. Well, let's just, uh, for kicks, call them the in-laws and the outlaws, okay? We, we operate based on those terminologies, and hopefully your in-laws are not outlaws in your family. I don't want to lose your, your attention by even mentioning that, but... Uh, well, James Montgomery Boyce, whose faith has become sight years ago, addresses a common gospel argument that you and I have gone through time and again. So I mentioned previously that every preacher who spends time trying to answer questions people have about Christianity has heard the question about the heathen over and over again. What about the poor heathen in a far-off jungle who's never heard about Jesus Christ? You know, somebody in the Booga Booga tribe that's never been found yet. Will God condemn him for failing to believe on a person about whom he's not even heard? I've answered that question in various ways over the years. Dr. Boyce says one of the answers I've sometimes given, particularly to those who are not yet Christians, is that if someday we get to heaven and discover that a number or even all of these untaught natives have arrived in heaven despite our failure to tell them about Jesus, all we'll be able to do is praise God for His great mercy and unfathomable ways we'll be happy. But if on that occasion we get to heaven, discover that not one of the untaught heathen is there, all of them having been condemned for failing to do what they knew they should do on the basis of natural revelation, we'll still praise God for His mercy to those to whom it was extended and acknowledge His justice in the heathen's case since the judge of all the earth always does right." Does the judge of the earth always do that which is right? That's Scripture. That's Genesis 18, 25. 
However, and this is a much better exposure than me, Dr. Boyce said, when I come to Romans 2.12, as we do now, I'm, I'm reproved for my answer. For the text does not suggest that the heathen may somehow get to heaven in spite of their ignorance of the gospel, but rather that they will be condemned like the others. Not for failing to believe on Jesus, of whom they have not heard, of course, but for failing to do what they knew they should do, even apart from God's special revelation. They may not have heard from the Bible, but they have heard from God by virtue of creation that we looked at in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Romans, his conscience. Well, this verse we are into now supports that view. You know, it even uses that term, perish. Anybody who has not bowed the knee to Jesus as Savior and Lord will perish. All who sin apart from the law will perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. While it's true that God is no respecter of persons, He does not exercise favoritism, partiality, He does respect the varying spiritual light, the conditions, the situations in which men find themselves in relation to knowledge of His law, because not everyone's the same. Not everyone's had the same experience. Paul's got two distinct groups of people in mind, those who are without the law, the pagan Gentile, and those that are under the law, the Jewish people. We've got outlaws and in-laws. Let's look at the outlaws first of all. He says in verse 12 here, those who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. Notice that law, uh, if you're in the NASB, is capitalized. It's helping helping our minds go back to the law of God, the law of Moses that they all had. So if, if the Gentiles don't have that law, Sinning without the law, the adverb is animos. The Greek term nomos is law, and the alpha at the beginning is of negation. They are without it, consistently meaning iniquity, lawlessness, or transgression of the law. We could unpack this, this truth in 2 Corinthians or Titus or Hebrews or 1 John other places that it's found, but let's just deal with this verse. Contrary to law. Here it's ignorance of the law. They don't have the law of Moses that they're accountable to. Paul says they're going to perish without the law. Heathen who sin, the Bible says they're lost. They are separated from God. Not because they don't have the Mosaic law, but because they don't keep the law that they do have. Not capital L law, the law that the Jews have of Moses, but little L law, which he's going to say more about in verses 14 and 15, but we'll save that for a moment. The issue here in verse 12, all who have sinned. They've transgressed God's law. I'd mentioned Boyce earlier. Well, he was uh, was talking about during his day when he was going through Romans, he said a few years ago in the church calendar of the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church, now uh, Dr. Boyce is an East Coast boy like me, or was an East Coast boy, and so he pastored 10th Presbyterian Church in Philly for years. But he said at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian, Under the pastorate of the late Henry Howard, there appeared a paragraph from his writings which included the statement that the people of today were through with that hellish doctrine which believed that God would damn souls who had never heard of Christ. 
That's why we're walking through this text and taking a little bit of time gingerly through verse 12 to develop Paul's argument. Our text indicates that God has to condemn souls who have never heard of Christ, not because they never heard of Christ, but because they have adopted for themselves the, definition, uh, the definite life choice of sin. We're sinners by nature, we're sinners by choice. You know, take that term, life choice, from another commentator, but believe it demands a little more explanation. Our text says that as many as have sinned without law shall perish without law, and that as many as have sinned with law shall be judged by the law. Now, at first glance, you might think that the text meant that anyone who had committed one act of sin would perish apart from any law. But there's something here more than the fact that all have sinned that will be brought out fully in the third chapter when we haven't read or heard yet in Paul's argument that there are how many righteous? None. How many seek after God? None. How many have sinned? All. That's all chapter 3. But verse 12 does say, all who have sinned without the law will perish without it. Every man has made life choices of sin. Whole life is taken here as a unit. The delusion in a lot of human thinking arises from the fact that men compare divine law to their own human law. And they think that God's going to judge on the same basis that underlies our human courts. Like some people that are guilty get off scot-free, right? Human law proceeds on the assumption that a man is not a thief unless what? He's stolen. He's not an arsonist until he has actually set fire to a building. He's not a murderer until he is actually killed. What's the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus teaches? That even if you have not physically committed adultery, you have a lustful heart of adultery. Though you have not physically killed anybody, you have a murderous, hateful heart. God's verdict is that man steals because he's a thief at heart. He destroys because he's a destroyer at heart. He kills because he's a murderer at heart. Furthermore, the human heart, because of the deceitfulness of sin, has adopted the delusion that those not chiefly guilty shall somehow wholly escape. That if I haven't done that deed, I'm not guilty. You think of the story recently heard of a boy who transferred to a different school and asked what the passing mark was at that school. And before there was time for any of his companions to answer, he said, stop, don't tell me. Whatever it is, it'll be too high for me to pass Latin. Well, you can apply that to God's standards and be sure that no man will ever be able to meet the demands of perfect holiness. And yet mankind persists in thinking it's possible for those who do a little better. You've heard me use the illustration before, like if there's an island 50 miles in the seashore and you jump from the coastline, you might jump a little further than any other man because you're fit, but every man is going to fall short. It's the same illustration, like little Johnny, who complained to his teacher that she had given him a zero on a certain question in arithmetic, and that she had also given zero to Billy, and that he thought the marking unjust. The teacher asked what the question had been. Johnny answered that it was to find the answer to eight times seven, and continued, Billy said that eight times seven were 46, and I said it was 54. <laughs> What's the difference? He's, he's 10 wrong, right? I was only two wrong. I think I should get a better mark than Billy. I'm more right, but you're wrong, equally wrong. You know, there are a million whole numbers from one to a million but they are all wrong for the question of eight times seven, except one true answer, 56. Now, that's awful narrow, 
and probably not so according to new math, but uh, it's true nonetheless. There might be a million and more options or opinions about the standards of righteousness, but the only way of keeping heaven clean from the filth of human sin is to provide a way whereby God can deal with the sin of man and give him by virtue of the grace of God and the death of Christ, the righteousness of God put to the sinner's account because of the love of God. And if that work is not done on behalf of the sinner, he stands condemned before God, end of story, no more theorizing. Outlaws, the pagan Gentile, God said, he sins without law, he'll perish without law. And don't too quickly skip over the doctrine of man perishing. It can only mean what the previous verses had defined perishing as. The infliction of God's wrath and indignation, the endurance of tribulation and anguish in contrast with those that for eternity will experience glory and honor and incorruption and peace bestowed on the heirs of eternal life that he talked about earlier in Romans 2. You know, I think uh, Paul could almost hear the Jew gearing up for a rebuttal here. You're talking about those wicked pagans. We're on them, like Jonah was on Nineveh and why he didn't want to go in the first place. Well, I'm not like all other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast Twice a week, I give a tenth of all I get. This is Luke 18, the self-righteous. He says, all these I have kept since I was a boy. As a matter of fact, Paul had thought like this himself before he met Christ. What was his pedigree? Paul was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, he was persecuting the church, and for legalistic righteousness, faultless. And in Philippians 3, where he gives his pedigree and his credentials, he said it's all scubalon, dung, nothingness before the eyes of a holy God. Later, Paul is going to deal with the religious person's false hopes more directly, but here he focuses on such people's actual performance. You know, he's he's saying, I know you know the law. Paul acknowledges that. But do you keep it? He reminds them that it's not those who hear the law that are righteous in God's sight. It's those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Verse 13. It's not the hearers, but the doers. That's the point of the passage. It's the point at which each of us falls down. Now, as political speak is gearing up for the next year, I've been hearing it for the last few months. Um, Any of you missed the the Gipper? Wish he was back in action. Uh, No political speech, but, uh, you know, at the time of the release of the Tower Report on the investigation of arms sales to Iran, the newspapers carried a headline in which our former president, Ronald Reagan, was quoted as admitting this, quote, everyone fell short. That's it exactly. (laughs) Paul's saying, except that In a matter of our own standing before God, the outcome is far greater import than political blunders. We're condemned by the law, all of us having failed to live up to its standards. We must seek salvation in another way entirely. We are the perfect lawbreakers. Christ is the only law keeper. So the lawbreakers, or or the... uh, the outlaws who didn't have the law, God said they're condemned. They, they will perish because they have still sinned. 
How about the in-laws? Do they get it off any better? Uh, all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law, through the law. You know, the Jews can't, can't deceive themselves into believing possession of the law is a badge of favored status. Remember what I said at the beginning of the sermon. It's no lucky rabbit's foot. Torah is not a talisman, a get-out-of-jail-free card with God's judgment. Remember in the order of history, the Jews received special revelation first of all. Natural, general revelation, though, will not save. It gets you going in the right direction. You understand that there's a creator God, and you respond to the limited light you're getting in general revelation. God is going to get you to the truth. He's going to send that missionary. He's going to pop you in a church, or you can't turn around without running into these Christians. If you heed it in humility, you seek for that God, he will be found. The Jews had been privileged far above the Gentiles. Paul works this out in chapter 1, verse 16. Later on in chapter 3, verse 1. And in chapter 9. But, does that, but that doesn't mean God will deal more generously with them because God doesn't have favorites. Verse 11. You know, this is a lesson that Peter had to learn. In, uh, in Acts 10, when he saw God's work in Cornelius' life, he was able to surmount his Jewish prejudice against Gentiles. In Acts 10, 34, here was Peter, the apostle's epiphany. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. In every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Doesn't matter whether you be Jew or Gentile. Recall the words of our Lord in Luke 12, 48, when he said that he who has been giving much, much will be required from him. From one entrusted with much, all the more will be demanded. Bad enough for the Gentiles that didn't have the law. Jews, you got a double dab. Not only do you have the written law of God, but you've broken every one of them as you've practiced iniquity. What counts now and in that great day is not possession of the law, hearing it in the synagogue, but conducting your lives according to its requirements. So this does not imply exoneration. No Jew has succeeded in keeping the law. So it's not a law thing. Whether you've got it or not, we break it. And this contrast in the second half of the verse, of verse 12, is a bit more frightful than the perishing and damnation of pagans. You know, they've got the Mosaic law, final judgment of the Jew and Paul's argument will be aggravated in correspondence with the gravity of their sin in knowing the requirements of the law. And neither one gets an excuse, the Jew or Gentile. And dear friend, don't delude yourself like many of the Jews that I've kept these things from my youth because there were surely parts of God's law he had not, but he missed that. It's simply not true. Paul seeks to undercut the Jewish position who's counting on his limited obedience to the law for acceptance with God. I've already said it in the sermon. Let me repeat myself to make sure we all get it. There has only been one perfect law keeper. What is God's standard? What is His his unaltering bar and standard? Perfection without sin. Notice there on, go down to verse 21 if you would. You therefore, he's talking to the Jew, looking at them eyeball to eyeball, who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach that one shouldn't steal, do you steal? You who say to one that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who 
abhor idols? Do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? Well, that's a convicting question. Paul's thinking of what we've been studying on Wednesday nights, the Pentateuch. You go to the Ten Commandments in your mind. Per one commentator, quote, on the contrary, disobeying the law, which is being constantly dinned into one's ears, will make condemnation so much more severe. It's one thing to be ignorant and not have the law, but Jews, you've got the law and you still didn't keep it. There's a contrast in the verse between those without the law and those under it. But the similarity for both is regardless of your situation, here's what brings you together. You're all sinners. Jew or Gentile. In chapter 3, we'll underscore that. So point number three, perfectly obedient doers, not religious hearers, as you move to verse 13. Perfectly obedient doers, not religious hearers. For if it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now, I said we didn't want to skip too quickly over that perishing, right? The verb that he used in the previous verse of perish without the law, the, the verb perish in the Greek and its noun usually translated destruction or perdition do not signify what many of proponents of our day do of annihilationism, that when you die, you have some kind of unconscious existence. That is not square with Scripture. When anything is said to perish or be destroyed, it is not meant that it ceases to be, but that it is so ruined that it no longer subserves the purpose for which it was designed. When Jesus was, was describing what happens when men pour new wine into old wineskins and the skins are said to perish. Those skins do not cease to exist. They're just busted. This noun perish or destruction or perdition is also used when the woman was anointing Jesus' feet with precious ointment and said, to what intent is this waste? As she busted that glass jar. Perdition, waste, destruction, perishing. It's always the same Greek word. It cannot mean cessation of existence then. You know, if we were to take our time and go to the last book, uh, the bookend of the Bible, Revelation, you read this word used in a way that localizes and defines what it means for destruction or perdition. In speaking of the doom of Antichrist, who shall someday emerge in our civilization for the final desperate warfare against God, we read this in Revelation, that the beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, Revelation 17, 8. And just a verse or two later, the word is repeated as though for emphasis that the beast goes into perdition perdition. Verse 11, the word perdition, translated destruction many times, comes from the verb which is in our text of Romans 2, which says that the ungodly shall perish. Why? Because he sinned, not that he doesn't have the law, or even that those that have the law, because they still sin, they break it. If we can find what the beast goes into when it's said that he goes into perdition, then we know what it is to perish. It's not to be an unconscious existence and be burned up by fire. Later chapter of Revelation, it said that he was, quote, cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, Revelation 19.20, and he is still seen there as conscious 
a thousand years later, Revelation 20, verse 10. Let me use for illustrative purposes a text that's probably much more familiar. What Christians have viewed to be the greatest verse in the Bible, where am I taking us to in our minds, in our thinking, John 3, 16. The Lord said that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not, what? Perish, but have eternal life, perishing in contrast with life forevermore. That word's in our text of Romans 2. Men need not perish if they what? Just come to Christ. That's why He came. If you only do that, you will not perish. Otherwise, you will go into destruction. This is clearly defined in the New Testament as the condition of being in a place of conscious and unending torment. You may not believe that doctrine. You may be like that Presbyterian preacher on the other side of the town from Dr. Boyce who said, We're away from this hellish doctrine. We were not going to teach that anymore. At least admit this is what the Bible teaches. So there's only been one perfect law keeper, one without sin, and it's through Him that we do not perish. Not, the hear, not just hearing about Him, but action, responding to that one. Now, Paul's already taught the importance of deeds earlier in chapter 2, what is perpetual practice, the actions of life that authenticate the reality. It doesn't matter what we profess. As a, you know, there's going to be people in our valley confessing until the cows come home, they're Christians, when the deeds of their life deny that profession. Judgment has always been according to works, and salvation is always received by grace alone through faith alone. Here in our text, we've got the first occurrence of those who have been justified in verse 13. Those who are just before God, and he's not necessarily using it the same way as he's going to use throughout the whole book of justification by faith alone and Christ alone. But maybe he is using it that way because it's still got a forensic meaning before the judge. Just before God. Who is just before God? James tells us in regards to the law that if you break just one, guilty of breaking them all, it's holistic. Jesus' standard in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your Father in heaven is. There's only one answer to Jesus there. I can't. You're right, we can't. And we recognize in humility our spiritual bankruptcy. We look to Him who can and was and is. So as he's talking to the Jews and the Gentiles here, hearing the law, possessing the law, was no advantage over the Gentiles. The Jews had the law but didn't do it. So they needed one to obey for them, which again is before our time, before what Paul develops later on in the book. Point four. As you move into verses 14 and 15, you see the law and conscience at work within. Notice them again. Gentiles, they don't have the law. But somehow they're instinctively doing the things of the law. How is that? Glad you asked. You know, if the Gentiles are without law, how can they be regarded as having sinned? Because Paul will later say in chapter 4, verse 15, where there is no law, neither is there transgression. So if they didn't have the law of Moses where God says, don't have any other gods before me, don't hate, don't steal, don't murder. No, they didn't have the capital L law written on the tablets, delivered on Mount Sinai, but they've got the law written internally. Paul states Gentiles possess 
the law too. And it shows in them keeping it. No, they couldn't take out the parchments of the law. But somehow they're doing these things. They do instinctively the things of the law. Think about that phrase for just a moment. Instinctively. It's literally naturally. It's contrasted with what is derived from external sources and refers to what's engraven on our natural constitution. What is done by nature and is done by native instinct, by spontaneous impulse. It's our default setting. Remember what he said back in chapter 1, verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. You go share the gospel to your family or friends this week, or you go with us to the growers market where we hand out tracts and have gospel signs. There's already other witnesses that have been present ever since these people have been born. There's the external witness of creation that says it's narrating and screaming everywhere there's a God that created you. Paul's addressing here this internal law, not the external creation, but man's conscience that's activated. Some commentators say presumably they are not matters peculiar to the law of Moses but moral and ethical requirements widely recognized and honored in mankind generally. What's God done when He created all of mankind? He's equipped us with an innate sense of right and wrong. It's not prompted or guided by a written code like Moses delivered. Theologian John Murray put it this way. He said, the things of the law must mean certain things which the law prescribes, and refer to those things practiced by pagans which is stipulated in the law, such as the pursuit of lawful vocations, the procreation of offspring, filial and natural affection, the care of the poor and sick, and numerous other natural virtues which are required by the law. Every civilization has this. No matter how bankrupt their system is, Paul says here that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. How do they demonstrate it? Because they do it. Each person is the medium of revelation. We're talking about their man's moral nature with its voice of conscience commanding and forbidding. Before Moses came down from Mount Sinai and busted the first tablets, right, in his anger because these people that God gave him to lead, right? Before the giving of the law, there was law, was there not? Think back in Genesis. The first murder was wrong. When Cain killed Abel, it was murder. It was against the law written in his heart before God says, thou shalt not murder. Okay? When Paul says that the work of the law is written in the hearts. I think he wants us to think of Moses and those tables of stone in the same way that God's finger wrote the law out on those stones. He has written the law in our hearts. There's a general moral norm built into his creation. You know, you see uh, one of the resounding themes you see in uh, the Old Testament and... um, In Old Testament ethics, is it okay to multiply wives? Because you find a lot of guys that did it. And Solomon, who was the wisest man that God endowed wisdom, was the worst perpetrator. It's like he wasn't wise, he was foolish as he multiplied wives. Well, before the giving of the law, you've got the first marriage. Adam and Eve. It's established that marriage is a... Man united with a woman. There's biology. Gender is a sexual issue, not other than their sex. One of each. Multiple wives was never condoned in God's law. Written or written in the heart. Paul uses language to get us thinking about that written law and stones so that we can understand what He's done in our hearts. The Gentile doesn't have the law. 
He'll at times do certain things required by God's law. He'll be kind to his wife and children. He's got a heart for the poor. He promotes honesty in government most of the time. Uh, shows courage in fighting crime. These are just, this is just common law written into man's heart by his creator. It's normal for cultures to value justice, honesty, compassion, goodness towards others. And that reflects the divine law written in our hearts. So even though they don't have the law, they got the law. Understand it. Don't confuse this, however, with Jeremiah 31, 33. The law is not inscribed on their hearts. It's the works of the law that are seen. It still takes special revelation. God's written law specifies on many levels what it looks like in our duty towards God and man. So it's not the issue of Mosaic law, but natural law. Basic requirements stamped on the human heart. He could say this because man's made in the image of God. Now, no person has talked about this moral law more effectively in latter years of history than the late Cambridge professor C.S. Lewis. And if you've read Mere Christianity, you know where I'm going with this. Lewis begins with the observation that when people argue with one another, an angry person almost always appeals to some basic standard of behavior that the other person is assumed to recognize. They say things like this, how would you like it if anyone did the same to you? Where does that come from? The law on the heart. That's my seed, I was there first. You parents heard a lot of that, right? Leave him alone, he isn't doing you any harm. Or why should you shove in first? Or give me a bit of your orange, I gave you a bit of mine. Come on, you promised. Why do we say such things? Well, Paul tells us why in Romans 2. Educated people as well as uneducated people, children as well as adults, use this logic of law in our hearts. What interests Lewis about these remarks is that the people making them are not merely saying that the other person's behavior just doesn't happen to suit them, but rather the behavior of the other person is simply wrong. There's got to be a standard for wrongness and rightness. He says the man who makes these remarks is appealing to some kind of standard of behavior which he expects the other man to know about. And the other man very seldom replies, to hell with your standard. Nearly always he tries to make out that what he has been doing does not really go against the standard or that if he does, there is some special excuse. He pretends there is some special reason in this particular case why the person who took the seat first should not keep it or that things were quite different when he was given the bit of orange or that something was turned up which lets him off keeping his promise. It looks, in fact, very much as if both parties had in, some, in their mind some kind of law or rule of fair play or decent behavior or morality or whatever you like to call it, about which they really agree. And they have. If they had not, they might, of course, fight like animals, but they could not quarrel in the human sense of the word. Quarreling means trying to show that the other man is in the wrong, and there'd be no sense in trying to do that har- unless you and he had some sort of agreement as to what right and wrong are. When uh, we were up where the game was going on for the Ducks yesterday, and when you've got a football player who commits a foul, how can that foul be called? Because there's, there's rules, there's a law, there's a standard. Same thing. Lewis had a marvelous fresh gift for stating deep things simply. Cannot escape us that this is precisely what Paul is saying in Romans 2. Gentiles didn't have the Jews' law, but they had a law within, a law that did not merely say that some kinds of behavior seem to work better than others or produce better responses, but rather went far beyond that either to accuse 
or excuse them of wrongdoing. Lewis begins his argument in another work, The Case for Christianity, by pointing out that when quarrels develop between people, the thing to be determined is who is in the right and who is what? In the wrong. The parties may differ radically as to their respective positions on this issue, but they are very clear that there is a right and there is a wrong. Similarly, despite despite the great differences in laws and customs among people around the globe, what unites them in a common humanity is the recognition that some things are right and what? Others are wrong. No excuses, no blame shifting, no lucky rabbit's foot for the Jews of the law nor the Gentiles who didn't have it. They've got the law written in their hearts and their conscience is he going to accuse them or excuse them? On the day when, according to my gospel, Paul says, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. You know, it's very easy to spin a story. Nobody can see what's going on as our conscience is activated. Well, while we're trying to argue against what our conscience is saying to somebody else, but there is coming a day of reality. You know, we've talked about your inner thoughts that no one knows but one, God Himself. There's coming a day that reality and judgment awaits. So Jesus will now be your Savior or then be judge. He knows the truth versus the profession. I love how Donald Gray Barnhouse captures this in a word picture here. He says, your conduct beats the drum that declares by your resounding good works that you know there's a divine law. Your conscience waves the flag that reminds you that often you have trampled your principles in the dust as you rushed past on your way to complete the desires of your own will. And the fife of your memory shrieks its refrain to remind you that you have sinned. The excuses and accusations of your thought run like shrill arpeggios in the counterpoint of your guilt. And the trio, conduct, conscience, and mind, are all in step with each other, in a perfect unison of condemnation because you have followed the road of your own will, refusing the road that forks at the cross of Jesus Christ that will lead you, if you follow, to eternal life. You know, we ought to be a, a led away from the attempts to justify ourselves by our works. We ought to turn to Christ where alone salvation may be found to admit that I am a lawbreaker. He's the only law keeper and His obedience credited to me for righteousness. We mentioned John 3.16. Speaks of two destinies, eternal life and perishing. The very ends Paul speaks about here in Romans 2. From birth, we are headed toward the second end, destined to perish miserably without God and without hope. But Jesus died to make another and entirely different destiny possible. It's the way of atonement with Jesus dying in our place, taking our punishment for sin upon Himself. It's a wonderful end. It is, as I've referred to C.S. Lewis, is what Lewis says, a thing of unspeakable comfort. Still, it does not begin with comfort. It begins with the knowledge of sin so that we might turn from sin to faith in Jesus. Why did Jesus come? To save sinners. So he decimates the argument between the Jews and the Gentiles. It's not a matter of the haves or the have-nots, the in-laws or the outlaws, because those who sin, whether it's under the law or without the law, will be judged. Let's look to him. Father, thank you for the fact of eternity that changed our lives, that when we could not come to you, you came to us. Your son was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life of righteousness under your law, the law that we broke. There was no excuse for the religious hypocrites to say that what Jesus did, he did through the power of Beelzebul. He did the work of God through the power of God. There's only one confession to be made, that He is Messiah. 
He is the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God, help us to find our satisfaction afresh in Him. For those that still need to turn from sin and embrace Christ, that this would be their day of salvation. And as we partake of the Lord's table, might we partake freshly on the accomplishments of another, the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.